Parent Relief. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'll wait just a few seconds here to let people get connected up. Uh, my name is Vanessa I'm with the Dallas Public Library, and we host this program series, Grow With Us, in conjunction with the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Um, just a few housekeeping things for today. Um, you will be muted and your cameras will be turned off. But if you have any questions or comments, um, please put those in the chat. Um, I'm sure you'll have a lot because I think this is a really wonderful presentation and you'll probably want to know how <laughs> uh, all things. Uh, we were talking talk about squirrels before the program, so I'm sure there might be some questions about squirrels too. Um, and also, um, this program will be recorded, so if you want to share it or watch it again afterwards, um, we'll have that link sent out. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Nedra, who's going to tell you a little bit more about what OEQS does and to introduce our speaker as well. Thank you so much, Nedra. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone. My uh, thank you for being with us today, and we're very excited to continue our partnership with the Dallas Public Library and to present this free program. Uh, my name is Nedra Richard Morgan, and I work for the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Our division is one of seven, 70 city departments and divisions within the city of Dallas, and our day-to-day -day focus is on environmental activities, processes, programs, and major plans such as the Comprehensive Environmental Climate Action Plan, also known as CCAP, and the new City of Dallas Comprehensive Urban Agriculture Plan. I wish to mention the public input survey that has been conducted for the Urban Agriculture Plan because our speaker today will have an interest in this work that is under development. I will drop the link into the chat. It just takes a few minutes to complete the survey and everyone is invited to participate. Our department works on water conservation and stormwater too. And there's a second program I wish to mention today because where would we all be without water? On Friday, February, April 1st, I'm sorry, the Wildland National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation kicked off through Mayor Johnson's office. Dallas is signed up to participate. This is a nationwide friendly challenge between cities to see who has the most water-wise residents. The challenge consists of a quick and easy pledge that can be taken daily or even multiple times a day at mywaterpledge.com. It is fair and easy to participate in this fun activity to be reminded of great water savings and also behaviors that positively impact our stormwater and other water resources. This is an exciting opportunity for Dallas to win three years in a row because Dallas, the winner in the big city category for 2020 and 2021. Let's go Dallas. We're so honored to have such an accomplished speaker for, with us today to tell us about creating an urban wildlife habitat in your landscape. Let me tell you about them. Dr. Leonard, Leonard I'm sorry, Nadalio. Lynn Nadalio was raised in Chicago where he helped his father grow vegetables in a victory style garden, vegetable garden in the backyard. The growing season was short in Chicago, but the soil was black and rich. Lynn went on to secure a degree in biology and ecology before becoming a physician. His love of nature and the need for balance were reinforced by his a Desert Southwest experience. While attending Northwestern University Medical School, he enlisted in the U.S. Army Medical Corps, where he then traveled to Washington State, San Antonio, Texas, Honolulu, Hawaii, Washington, D.C. for the next 10 years. He enjoyed the variety of plants and animals that made up his neighborhood in each location. For the past 35 years, he has lived and gardened in Dallas, first as a road specialist and more, more recently as an advocate for sustainable gardening while maintaining an urban wildlife habitat. Lynn lives with his wife, Barbara, and his dog, Hutch, in North Dallas on a creek surrounded by nature and amazing wildlife. Lynn is a certified Texas master gardener for the Dallas County specializing his talks on our topic today and avoiding hazards while gardening. He also has a certification from the Native Plant Society of Texas and is a member of that organization. In fact, he is a member of 10 area clubs focused on gardening and plants. Let me mention Lynn's special recognition and awards because they are also so interesting. Nuclear Officer Field Training of the U.S. Army, 
the General Erskine Award Best Fellow at Walter Reed Army Medical Center from 1999 through 2000, Fellow of the American College of Radiology, Certificate of Advanced Training and Qualification in Neuroradiology. So before I turn the program over to Lynn, let me tell you about this education because it is quite impressive. Lynn attended, attended North Park University in Chicago, Illinois, graduating summa cum laude with a BA in natural sciences and ecology. He went on, on to attend Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago, Illinois, receiving his medical degree with honors in the physical examination and pathology. Please join me in welcoming Lynn to the virtual podium. Well, I certainly will have to shorten my bio in the future. Thank you very much. That was You're welcome. Uh, that was almost embarrassing. <clears throat> I am about to share with you some of my favorite ideas. And while they're my ideas, they're shared with many other people. Number one, we all want to live in a good environment. And I think one of the things I've learned as becoming and you know, sharing other thoughts with other master gardeners is how much we have in common when it comes to what we're looking for. <clears throat> we are a voluntary organization. Um, all of the efforts and the money raised goes to the fostering of further programs and as an extension uh, into the neighborhood. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about an urban wildlife habitat. Well, whether you know it or not, you live in one. Even if you didn't want to, we have birds, butterflies, bees, and fortunately some flowering plants. Uh, but what we really want to do is organize it in such a way to maximize fresh air, relaxation, and exercise. Uh, <clears throat> number one, they make you feel better. And as a physician, I can tell you they more than likely will make you live a little longer. Now, urban wildlife habitat means we're facing an increasingly urban existence in Texas. We need nature within our city because the city has grown so much and cities are touching cities. 86% of Texas is now urban. We also need to conserve the use and collection of water. One of the sad things is that increasingly the development of new homes means a clear cut and the trees are the first things to go. Now these trees took maybe a hundred years to grow and just a few weeks or weekends for them to be destroyed. We'd rather see development that is staged and systematic. Unfortunately, we have this kind of development, um, not to offend anyone who lives in homes like this, but it's monolithic, it's touch to touch, and if I'm a bird, butterfly, or bee, I don't know where to land, okay? Um, and the problem is the water that would normally soak into this area is largely gonna run off and we have a green space, uh, a very thin green space, but I didn't see very much else. The other thing I've learned increasingly in my own neighborhood and elsewhere is the incredible amount of noise pollution. You know, one of these uh, blowers is as loud as many loud automobiles or buses and the poor guys are carrying them around. Now there are electric ones which are a little bit quieter, but certainly the problem we have is an increasing created problem with air and water. This is an example of my own property two years ago. Uh, it looks pretty good. I have my American flag, which I'm proud of. But you notice those pittosporum in the front, those are the ones with the green, uh, slightly oval leaves. They're gone. The big freeze proved they didn't belong here. They were not native, and I had not learned how to treat uh, native landscapes. This is taken from our Earth Kind program, which is something we sponsor through uh, Dallas County Master Gardeners and Texas A&M. And it's too long a list to go through individually, but I'll point out that mulching, irrigation, auditing, low volume irrigation, and especially the uh, use of drip line irrigation where possible, all conserve water, reduce weeds, and are helpful. Now, how do we know things are bad? Well, in the last decade, a vast number of amphibians, frogs, toads, salamanders, have disappeared from the earth. Now, not too many people care that much about frogs, toads, or salamanders until they realize they're what we call a sentinel 
or an index species or group of species. Where they go, we will go. So what happens to a species? Well, we start out being common, and all of a sudden, it is a precipitous drop in the number of amphibians, maybe also birds, maybe also bees. We know we have to have bees because we have to eat. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so we get to what we're talking about today, wildlife habitats. Now, what does it take to do a wildlife habitat? Well, fortunately, not a lot. Almost anyone can do it. We want to provide food, water, cover, and some place for uh, whatever bird, butterfly, or bee to raise their young and finally have a sustainable practice where we don't poison everything or destroy the soil in the, in the process. Most people would do this ordinarily on their own. This is sort of common sense. But what we are going to say is you can organize it, and it doesn't have to take a lot of space. I would say that you can do a simple urban wildlife habitat in a yard, on a balcony, in schoolyards, in workplace landscapes, or in any common area that you may have an association with. Once again, food, water, cover, place of the rarest young, and the use of sustainable practices that won't damage or destroy. Now I've come to love native plants. They were been here longer than we were. <clears throat> They're the ones who survived the big freeze and a smart bird native to here or a butterfly or bee that is either native or traveling through for the east of time knows where to go for a good meal. They go to native plants. Well adapted plants are second best. Some of them are well adapted to the expense of those that they surround. And then finally, there are those plants which provide sustenance. To, to live, you must have water. The good examples of natural ones are streams and ponds that live near a creek. Um, and that, that gives me a sense of that. Rainwater capture, I have a total of 140 gallons in my tanks right now, two different areas, and it's wonderful water. It's got a pH of seven, it's not hard. Garden features are also nice. They're very soothing. We all like water. The movement of water is something I enjoy. Cover and protection is really simple. Dense shrubbers. A good example would be a Buford holly or an other type of holly where there's a place for the bird, sometimes butterflies and bees, to hide out during one of these big storms we have. Tall grasses, vines, and trees. Hummingbirds are going to be something we're going to be talking about here. And they're big on milkweed. The milkweed plant is uh, especially though for monarch butterflies. Anything with a long tubular flower is going to attract typically hummingbirds. That's the nature of their beak and that's how they... Uh... Now the dead tree guys are woodpeckers. Right now I have a stand of birds burrowing into a side of one of my uh, structures outside and they're making a nest and I'm happy about it. How do we organize all this to make it easy? Well, the National Wildlife uh, Society has given us the opportunity by calling it a wildlife habitat. And you can get a little sign and you follow a simple set of instructions. And if you want, you can also get a nice plaque. What do we include as a natural food source? Well, milkweed plants, and hence they see the a monarch, provide nutrition in two ways. The larvae eat the leaves, absorb a toxin, which renders them immune to enemies, while the adults come back and take food, in this case, nectar. You know, the, the adults don't really eat, they, they only drink. This is a real shot from uh, a real milkweed plant. Um, and we have a couple more in here, and these are all taken either by myself or other Dallas County Master Gardeners. That's an example of what we call symbiosis. And thanks to uh, Beverly Allen, this is one that was taken fairly recently last year. Again, it's a slightly different uh, butterfly, but it is nonetheless on a milkweed plant. So these milkweed plants grow very readily. They're inexpensive. They don't require sprays, typically. Another good uh, solid base plant, very attractive, is Mexican sage. This is what the monarchs also favor to drink the nectar, the adult monarch. 
they have to fill up their tanks. You know, they're going hundreds of miles and over several generations, but nonetheless, the adults must consume calories like we all do. It's also a beautiful plant. Um, it freezes down in the winter, but comes back. Now, when it comes to birds, they favor seeds, obviously. And one of the most prolific, easiest to grow is the purple coneflower, shown here. Um, it attracts all kinds of birds, but especially songbirds. And while we put up bird feeders, I've got seven, um, nothing is as good or as nutritious as fresh seed. Another wonderful plant, easy to grow, inexpensive to buy and grow, is the bee bomb. Yes, yeah, a real word. And as you can see here, monarchs go for the long tubular flowers, where there is, in fact, an ample amount of nutrition. And it's the sort of thing that's reserved for them, because not too many other creatures on Earth either beat their wings so fast or have such a long beak. We'll get into another plant in a moment. The red-eyed buckeye. This is a nice native plant. Again, notice the long tubular flowers. It's a little bit rangy looking, but you know, you have to have a little bit of that in order to allow for all of the wildlife we're trying to accomplish here. The tubular flowers though are attractive and it is uh, easily to grow. Big push for the Herd Museum in McKinney. Um, these, I'm showing you here, some of the flowers they exhibit, which specifically are addressing hummingbirds, uh, butterflies, and other bee creatures. Um, and again, the Herd Museum, great place to visit. Become a member if you can. Then there are the flowers you wouldn't even believe could be captured. This is a hummingbird that has been very busy. Each of those tiny tubular flowers is going to give him a reward or her a reward of a tiny bit of energy. And I, I guess you understand they're beating their wings enormously rapidly. They use a tremendous amount of calories and their heart beats at a phenomenal rate. And they have a definite niche in nature. All these things we're looking at have a place. Now, one of the world's great flowers because it grows anywhere. It grows in sun, grows in shade. Um, it's not eaten by much or ever is Turk's cap. It's a true native. I want to point out that there is a nice deep tubular flower. This again is reserved pretty much for uh, hummingbirds, but some butterflies are able to get into it. Another great Texas superstar um, is lantana. It comes in varieties. We would prefer we get lantanas which are native, but the Texas Superstar program gives us some which are well adapted from other places. Now here are some of the flowers that are featured at the Herd Museum. You can go out there and see these flowers in the summer and spring, or you can um, become a member and come and they have an annual plant sale and get some of these. The brown-eyed Susan, very commonplace, very attractive, easy to grow. Rock rose, now none of these plants require unusual conditions. But what about our friendly birds? Well, bird feeders come in a variety of sizes and shapes. The one I'm showing you is a particular favorite of mine because it's a squirrel buster. Literally, it's a brand. I'm not selling the brand, but it protects from the uh, feed being taken by the squirrels. Clean the feeders regularly. That is to say, they need to be cleaned with a light amount of either ammonia or bleach and then rinsed because the salmonella is a risk to birds. Have a little fun in your garden. No, that is not my wife and I. That is instead um, what we hope to be in 10 or 15 years um, in our garden. <clears throat> but I'm showing it because it's a shelter. You notice the uh, hollies in the background, uh, long leaf plants, a water source, and a food source, and it's really very popular in my backyard. Here's a part near the creek, and it's just for water. Now, the water must be kept clean. So you develop a routine when you water your plants, you also clean the water out because it can get become kind of grainy when the birds take their bath, you know, or, or a drink. We have the great freeze. Now, how do you do the right thing in the great freeze? You do it in quantity. 
So this is my backyard with the ice. And I literally just took a bag or a couple bags, took a couple of garbage cans out and spread the food. We may have had 125, 150 birds came in small flocks. This was the next day. You know, it was a two day event. Um, was it harmful to the environment? Not at all. These birds didn't ask for global warming or whatever caused the uh, polar vortex to reverse. And they just had to survive. And you know, they burn a lot of calories in the cold. And so that was my effort. We have to protect against squirrels. I, I don't care that much for squirrels, but I don't dislike them. But I don't want them to eat the bird food. So as I said, the squirrel buster has a option of a cover. And then there's this metal cover, which can be added to any other squirrel, any other bird feeder rather. And here is a confused squirrel. Um, problem is if you locate your bird feeders anywhere near a branch, they'll drop down. They'll come down and eat upside down sometimes. Large capacity is good. Once a week is all the time I have. Spring loaded keeps the birds happy because it's weight bearing. You can do a finch versus cardinal setting on these. So the spring can be at a different setting. And if it's easy to take apart, then you get rid of the seeds that can sprout and you get rid of salmonella risk to migrating birds. Let's talk about water. The best water is probably natural. And this is an example of a natural creek near my home. <clears throat> Not mine, I wish I owned it, but it's actually part of the city um, water system. But the water is clear. I actually have taken samples from it. We get very little runoff. But what do you want if you're a bird? Well, this is a little of my wife's artwork, so I make it a little arty. The water is clean. It's still, believe it or not, birds do not favor moving water. That's a misnomer. And you want to have something in the center for them to sit on because some birds don't have very long legs. Um, and you want to keep it clean. And as I showed you this picture briefly before, Often they want protection. So the birds will roost up here and they'll take a mad dash, take a drink, and try to get back before they're caught by a hawk or, or whatever predator they might be looking at over their shoulder. Food, water, and shelter. Now, here's the water moving down the easy little creek. This is the flow as it looks closer to the main body next behind me. And then Put your bird baths, if possible, in a shaded area because in a 95 degree day, the water evaporates and it's definitely not um, amenable to the bird. And this is a single corner volunteered by Beverly, again, from our Master Gardener program. And you see there's food source, water, and almost a kind of a shelter. And, and again, we emphasize, please choose whenever possible native plants. On the other hand, there's the poppy. Isn't this a beautiful plant? Incredible how many bees. This is from the rain catcher gardener where I volunteer. And it was just incredible the number of bees that would flock. Um, and again, some plants, which are good for nature, are very pleasing to the eye. Again, each of these flowers represents a tubular food source. Now, what about learning more about what we're here for? Well, if you have a camera like I do, you can learn just by taking a photograph, submitting it to the iNaturalist software, and it does, uses an algorithm, they all do. It'll tell you what you're looking at, and it'll tell you something about it. You can also contribute back information. So this can be a two-way street. Now, here's the example of a symbiosis. Yes, this is a swallowtail caterpillar enjoying a meal. And at the same time, this renders it um, for the next generation. So we can't look at some of our flowers with holes in them or our plants with holes in them and, and not understand that if we want to encourage nature, we have to give up a little bit. The, here we have uh, flowers again. Now, the flowers need not be unattractive. They can be beautiful. And they don't have to be native, although obviously the cone flowers and sunflowers typically are. Now, this is an example of wildflowers. 
And I can tell you, you can do this very inexpensively. Just take a section of your backyard, get a good quality mix, wait until the last freeze is passed, roughen up the soil, and you can have this. Now, I believe this is attractive. It's soothing. Now, this is my backyard, okay? And it didn't always look this way. Uh, it's taken a while to get it this way after I moved from Parker, Texas to here. The creek is back there, though you wouldn't necessarily know that. And all of these are the sustaining plants that I've talked to you about, including a Mexican sage. Now, what about our other little creatures out there? These are literally uh, creatures that have come upon us either in our volunteer work or in our backyards and were contributed by Dallas County Master Gardeners for this lecture. A little toad and then a couple of lizards. Now, these are harmless, but they're going to eat some of the things we don't want. Now, these are collected from my own neighborhood. This is a beautiful animal. It's a red fox, not a coyote, a red fox. Obviously, you know raccoons. Uh, please, for your benefit, stay away from raccoons. They have sharp teeth. This is an opossum up close, caught me off my guard. Migratory birds don't know quite what to make of us. And so sometimes they have to look down on us and basically make up a decision. They're looking for fish, largely. Big plus for the National Wildlife Federation, of which the sponsorship is for doing a certified master gardener or certified wildlife program. And these are red foxes, beautiful animals. This is a screech owl. Again, uh, it's become very fashionable in my neighborhood to announce their first arrival. I have an owl house up, no comers yet. I might have put up the wrong size owl house. Now, what can you do if you live in a small community or what if you live in a community and you have no land of your own? Participate in the professional planning part of it. Join a committee, research what you can do with whatever space you have. Most places have green space. This is the home I lived in in Parker, Texas, um, near Allen, before I moved to Dallas. And this was my home. You notice that I had quite a grove of trees. I had nine different kinds of trees. And it took me about 17 years to evolve that. Doesn't take anything but 25 minutes online and a couple of days thinking to get your landscape certified for wildlife. It's uh, online at the website for the National Wildlife um, Institute. I always want to put in a promotion for Plant Tag. I am a volunteer with an organization that is attempting to develop a line of communication through the phone to help people find the right plant, to go at the right location, and eventually to find out where they can get that plant. Um, I'm one of the people who writes profiles and right now we've got literally thousands of profiles available and this is free. You just have to uh, sign up for the program, you add the app to your phone and go through a few uh, instructions and then you can actually tailor your yard into the uh, database. You can find out why something's not growing or alternatively, you can add more time um, to choose plants because you'll be able to use a phone, which is a very efficient app. <clears throat> we hope eventually to have the ability to direct you to appropriate places where you could acquire uh, the various things that we're recommending or suggesting. Again, it's plant tag. If you go to any of the gardens on the Dallas County Master Gardener um, garden uh, show, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, you will find out that they have been plant tagged. And I'm in the process of adding my own garden to the collection. So plant tag, it's free. Um, at this point, all you need to have is a phone. You don't have to have any technical skill. There's a website if you have questions and we certainly want to uh, answer questions. And this number is continuously growing <clears throat> as we continuously do more of the uh, actual advertisements. 
Uh, by the way, our suggestions in the plant tag program are done in conjunction with the recommendations that we uh, uh, accept as Dallas County Master Gardeners and that the Texas A&M Aggie Life Program promotes. So we have attempted to encourage people to choose plants that don't use a lot of water. We've inter we encourage people to use little or no artificial um, harsh chemicals that use only insecticides when absolutely necessary. And in general, to do a soft touch. So earth kind is what we're talking about. Now, there are other programs on the state level that are attempting to conserve. Um, and this is one of those action plans. Uh, it's a little hard to get involved on the state level unless you have time. But it is important that we do it on the state level because we all drink water. And I guess you all know that practically none of the lakes in Texas are natural lakes. They're reservoir lakes. There are other things. Uh, this was a program that uh, was out a few years ago. It still is inactive. And, and tracking and numbering and identifying amphibians. Now, I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. There is beauty in the symbiotic relationship between plants and animals, and we are, after all, an animal. We breathe air, we drink water, and there's a lot of beauty that can be captured with a camera, and this is just with our ordinary amazing cameras that we have in our phones. And again, the uh, these are all taken regionally. These are not um, artificial, if you will. Now, are there any risks to any of this? Well, very quickly, as a physician, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the difference between the innocent scarlet king snake, which occurs here, and the coral snake, which is venomous. And, and basically, <clears throat> you can see the difference in the rings. What about rattlers, or they look like rattlers? This is a friend, the Texas rat snake. This is someone that you want to stay away from. They're not our enemy, but we don't want to uh, reach our hand into rocks. We don't want to take unnecessary risks. Uh, if you come upon bats, skunks, or foxes, and they act aggressively, back off. Uh, most animals are not aggressive to man. They are instead aggressive if they become ill. So what you can achieve, again, this is my own property, and two different times of the year, you see that with, with the flowers out, and you see with the early spring, two different looks. Late in summer, it takes on a more sparse look, and yet it's a welcome look. And this is a sign I probably have in my backyard saying that we are a National Wildlife Federation certified wildlife habitat. My wife helps, my grandchildren help, and I would like to encourage anyone to give it a thought. We are a service organization to Dallas County Master Gardeners. We hope to answer questions. We hope to help you avoid mistakes or problems with your landscape. We have a help desk. And the help desk is uh, intended for that purpose. We're going to have a uh, spring garden tour in the uh, Saturday, April 30th, and Sunday. There will be wonderful gardens. I'm only going to be at one. I'm going to be acting as answering some questions at one of them. I plan on visiting them all. It's always good to see others with the ideas they have. Again, that's going to be April 30th. And then uh, the next day on Sunday, tickets are available at each of the gardens and all the money will go to back into service in the Dallas County Master Garden Program. Um, we strongly encourage you to join us uh, if you've never considered it. Uh, the educational process is not difficult if you pay attention. I like going to school. Uh, I learned things even though I had gardened all my life. So once again, if you're interested in becoming a master gardener, we would strongly ask you consider joining by looking into our website. All the questions are answered there. The program is given once per year. And so with that, I'm open to any questions if anyone has you know, entered them. 
I certainly thank the opportunity um, to talk about one of my favorite subjects, being outside. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Vidalo. Um, if you have any questions, please put those in the chat. Um, so I have one, I, I know we were talking a little bit before about my, my kitten and what plant, house plant she can't eat. Are there any plants that you should not plant in your landscape um, that might be dangerous for birds or other creatures? Anything well, birds are smarter than we. <laughs> so I'm gonna think about that just a second. Um, I'm not aware of plants that are poisonous to birds. However, there are a fair number of plants uh, that we should not have in our homes because they are potentially injurious. A lilies of the valley, for instance, is one that's pretty commonly had around the house. Now, it's not horribly poisonous, but it certainly can cause a kitten or a cat stomach upset, and that would call it the owner upset. Um, there is actually a very good resource, and I'd be happy to submit it to any of your to you or anyone else that I put together, and there's another talk altogether about staying safe in the garden. But belladonna, okay, is actually a medication. It, it is also a flower, okay, and it is castor beans. So seeds of the castor plant are notorious. In fact, they're used in novels as a form of poison and uh, the substance you probably heard about it in spy mysteries called ricin or ricin is a poison that is contained in plants. Um, I have a book, it's about an inch and a half thick of all the plants that we know of that are hazardous to one's health. It's a lot of plants. Um, surprisingly, most animals have the common sense not to chew on things more than once. So a lot of plants are toxic to the extent of causing gastrointestinal distress. Or as we all know, some people are allergic. It's not an L, it's not actually a poison, but the poison ivy, it's a hyperimmune response. Uh, I am, and some people, 10 or 15% of the population is, and some people are profoundly. Now there is one thing you should never burn any clippings that you might suspect are poison ivy. That's a very high risk. Uh, so therefore, obviously, you wouldn't allow poison ivy to take over large sections of your yard. In general, if you don't know what you have, don't put it into your compost pile. Discard it instead. And surely anything that you have that's diseased, badly diseased, may make it through the composting process. So we want to put clean material into our compost pile and everything else we're going to have to pass on to the city. Um, I'd be very happy if someone that submits, you know, um, a request to provide a long list. Yeah, definitely. I, I know that's, um, a issue um, in dealing with like school gardens and things as well is to make sure that you're growing things <laughs> and not having anything that's dangerous for the kiddos to be around well, to you. And just as another plug for plant tag, part of our, that process in every single plant that we enter into the database, we assess it for safety, including the, the rare possibility that there's someone could have a, not a poisonous response, but a hyperimmune skin response. Uh, you know, that was getting skin irritation. Yes, I, I got a very bad rash from um, growing habanero plants one year. I had a very bad reaction to the, to the well, habanero plant. you put plant. that on the list for you. <laughs> <laughs> for, for me, yeah. Um, so uh, I know you mentioned the importance of, um, you know, growing native plants and growing plants for shelter for animals. Um, how do you feel about, I, you've seen those cute little like toad houses and other little things? Well, how do I feel about it? I think they're cute. <laughs> um, do, they, do they work? <laughs> well, I found toads under rocks in my backyard because I don't disturb them. <laughs> they will, 
nature will find a way. Now, I think they're cute, and if, if it fosters a, an appreciation for the yard, it's a good thing. But an ordinary rock or a bit of area of your yard that's kept a little bit messy is actually a better place for things, mostly welcome, to find shelter. We are having extreme weather events. And I don't want to get on the downer, but we all know that, you know. And if you're a bird, you need something to hold on to with a windbreak. And if you add a, a 10 degree temperature, you can imagine what that's like. Similarly, uh, we were going to talk about squirrels. Why not? Squirrels have a place. And I don't like to see anything suffer. So my wife actually, I didn't have a photograph of it in here. It's in another talk. It's a little bench, looks like a picnic table. And there's a big spike and you put a corn on the cob on it. So she actually feeds the squirrels. And they are cute. Uh, although once they eat a certain amount, they run away with it. So they don't, they don't sit there. But they're very photogenic while they're doing it. But seriously, um, a better question that maybe to ask is elaborate fountains. People spend a lot of money, water goes in the air and so forth. A lot of the water gets evaporated. If it's an aesthetic you're wanting, great. But slowly moving water or move water that isn't moving at all is gonna have a lot more frequent flyers. I have a swimming pool, almost never have a bird go in where the water is moving to take a drink, always go to the bird feeders where I also have water sources. So, and then in the back, the creek that I live nearby has a stream. They go to the stream, they don't go to the creek. The little estuary that is slowly moving. So we wanna emulate what they want to the extent we can. Uh, some people say, well, do I have to have a lot of space? No. Quite literally, if you think about it, if you allow a, a big shrub to grow, a little bit of water in a pan, or a dish, you know, ideally in a bird bath because it's at least a half inch deep, and you put up a clean bird feeder, or you throw bird seed on the ground, that actually meets some of the criteria. What's more important though is that we commit ourselves to keeping it up. It is it is not fair for a flock of birds to become frequent flyers, pun intended, and then you just give up. Um, I would big shout out to Wild Birds Unlimited. They do a lot of good things, and that's a great source of bird seed. Um, I know you also talked about uh, like all the plants that the hummingbirds like. Um, should we also put out hummingbird feeders? Um, or is it better to have the, the flowers? Absolutely you can, because we I've had hummingbirds here already in my backyard, and none of the flowers are open yet. We, again, I don't want to overemphasize this, and I'm not a conspiracist. I just understand that I understand ecology. Birds need consistency. And we need to help, I think, or have a responsibility to assist in getting through the rough patch. So the hummingbird feeders will provide nectar in the way of sugar water, energy, at a time when the flowers may not be yet open. Do I don't know, there are hummingbird experts who could answer this, if hummingbirds would ever go to an artificial feeder in preference to their tubular flower friends. But at least in my backyard, there are so many tubular flowers opening and, you know, terse cap is one of them. I've got it in seven locations in the, in the complete shade, in full sun and everything in between. Nothing eats it. It's, it grows almost like a weed. You can take a clip of it and, and duplicate it easily. Friends can share from one plant. Uh, and that's just one example. It's a, it's a great plant. It's one of the Texas 100 recommended plants from the US, Texas A&M. Um, a lot of the tubular flowers are even from foreign 
in, in, outside of Texas origin or even European origin still provide nectar. It's just that it may not be at the right time or the shape of the flower may not actually meet the specifications, if you will, of a particular hummingbird. That's a good point. Um, and we can eat Turk's cat too. The flowers are, are pretty tasty, actually, I think. <laughs> I know people who make jelly and stuff out of them. Um, let's see. So um, Judy had a question about, she said her hummingbird feeder was popular two years ago, um, but last year and this year, not so much. Um, there's no birds there. Do you know what possibly she could be doing wrong? She's wondering if it's possibly the location she has um, the hummingbird feeders meet near some regular bird feeders. Would that be an issue putting them too close to a regular bird feeder? It might. Uh, hummingbirds, you know, are tiny, almost infinitesimal in some cases. They vary in size. I have my hummingbird feeders in four locations on their own. Um, I'm not trying to observe the hummingbirds necessarily. If I have the opportunity, I appreciate it because of the Turk's cap and of the other tubular flowers, because they tend to spend time going from flower to flower. And that's fun to watch. Uh, I think we're doing a service with the bird feeders. We're not necessarily, now if you get a nice telephoto lens and you stay back, the location should be uh, not hidden, but also not in competition with other bird flight. Remember also the other birds would be attracting predators. Uh, we have red tailed hawk and every occasionally, sadly, I'll see feathers only on my uh, lawn. Well, we know that's what's happened there more likely than not. Um, so location, I think it's probably location. The other thing is to clean it out every three days. It, it, whatever it causes, whatever bacterium, I'm not sure. But I'm told by a, a wonderful lecture I just took a couple of weeks ago that hummingbirds can sense if it's not, if it's not healthy for them and they move on. Um, maybe that's why they, you know, survived all these eons. That's, that's a good point. With the poisonous plants and that, sometimes animals know better than, than people do. <laughs> Um, and so um, Priscilla was wondering if you, um, you've seen a lot of different types of bird baths, very shallow to uh, really deep ones. Um, and she said, it is like you mentioned earlier, the, it's hard to keep water in the shallow ones because of the evaporation. Um, could you talk about like what would be the ideal water depth and what's the best way to clean a bird bath that's too heavy to move? Um, would you, do you ever put like um, the mosquito dunks or anything in your bird bath? Yes, I do. Uh, routinely, well, first of all, I don't, I, I personally do not attach the tops of the concrete or stone uh, bird baths to their base. I have yet to have a wind blow one over. Uh, they're so heavy anyway. What I do is when I water, I normally don't spray the foliage. I have a lot of drip line irrigation, but where I do have access to hoses, I just wash clean the bird bath routinely. Now that's probably every other day. If I miss a day because of weather, I'll, I'll do that. It only takes a second or two. I would say the depth is not as important as it not be not too deep. It can't be too shallow. I mean, if it's there and they, if they can see it. You notice that the design of most bird baths have in the center a raised area. So if you get a bird bath that is, let's say, three inches deep or four inches deep, which is pretty deep for bird baths, then I think it's obligated to put a rock or something uh, so that the birds don't have to take a bath. They, some do not want to take a bath every time they take a drink. The other reason for that is that if you notice, birds will eat and then they'll fly away. They don't linger because they're instinctually concerned about predators. They're not afraid of us. They're afraid of, you know, again, hawks or perhaps uh, kittens, you know, feral cats. Um, so I would say, and I'm not, I've not done a personal study, 
but I have an observational opinion that you don't want it too deep, that moving water is pleasant to listen to, only larger birds will frequent in it. For 17 years, I had a property I showed briefly in Parker, and in all that time, only large birds like ducks and cranes would go anywhere near the waterway I built. <laughs> they would go to all the bird baths, but no, not to that moving water. Part of it was open, therefore vulnerable. And where, where the other places with water were protected at least on one side completely by foliage. Um, don't spend a lot of money in bird baths, by the way. You can buy them, pun intended, rock cheap or dirt cheap at used furniture outlets, places that sell curios, beautiful ones. And then for a, a dollar or 50, or if you know, my wife will give a lesson on how to adorn old pots. She loves painting old pots. She's an artist. And you can make something curiously pleasant that was pretty awful looking before. Birds don't care. And thereby you can have six water sources instead of four. You don't even have to spend a lot of money. And the, the big clunky ones don't crack. Buy an expensive anything. And as soon as it gets two and a half inches of frozen water, it has a risk of cracking. That's another reason for not having very deep bird baths is that once they form a solid block of ice, they may crack in half. Those are some very good points too. And um, one another reason to encourage the, um, the hummingbirds is I just recently found out that they eat a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, I didn't Absolutely. realize... Yeah. I, I didn't realize that. Well, of course, the famous ones are Purple Martins, but certainly I didn't choose to emphasize the Audubon Society, but I'm a member of the Audubon Society. I think that you can't have <clears throat> an affinity for nature without loving birds. So these things all kind of fit together. Uh, they don't all fit together necessarily in one talk. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm... And this will be a last call for any questions for Dr. Nadal. I know you've shared so much great things that people are probably thinking about it and <laughs> taking notes and <laughs> deciding what they're going to put in their backyard now. <laughs> uh, so last call for any questions that people may have. Um, Once again, I'd like to emphasize we have a help desk. Any question, it, the only bad question is a question you forgot to ask. You had a question you didn't ask. You never got it answered. Our help desk, uh, and I'm also a participant in helping the help desk. So um, I can say that well-intended people will give you answers which are science-based and are within the Texas A&M Aggie philosophy of first do no harm, um, tread lightly, and earth kind. Yes, that's a great resource that more people need to know about. Um for all those garden questions that come up. Because <laughs> um, sometimes like the big box stores don't give you the best advice on your plants when you Let buy- point out one thing, the big box stores are still selling the very same plants that froze in the big freeze. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so they, they you know, don't necessarily pay attention to regional needs. They just send out the same plants to all of their stores and <laughs> we went- Whatever the, the reason, I'm not, I'm not against big boxes. I buy things sometimes of necessity, but I also strongly recommend you find a, a trusted two or three or four landscape outlets. If one doesn't have it, uh, another might keep them open, keep them in business, uh, especially those who keep true Texas native plants in stock. And there aren't that many unfortunately, but the North Texas Native Plant Society in conjunction with the Herd Museum will have plant sales. And there's one coming up in April. Yes, those are amazing. Um, I think the Texas Discovery Garden occasionally has native plant sales as well. Absolutely, um, and, and 
there are so many good organizations, it's not possible. And I didn't mean to slight them. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so there's less. Uh, I, I know I, I was saying that because I've gotten a few plants from there before <laughs> that are doing, that actually survived the freeze and are doing really well. So yeah, there's something to be said about planting plants that are adapted to our region, um, both as you pointed out for the wildlife and for the fact that you don't have to replace them after you get a big freeze. <laughs> and, and again, uh, please use our resources. That's what we're here for. We're happy to do it and happy to answer questions. Um, all right, well, thank you all so much for um, joining us today. Um, we will be back, um, in, I think two weeks with native ferments, um, learning about how do you ferment your, your uh, materials and I'll send out in a follow-up email um, how to register for that. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom, your many years of, <laughs> um, perfecting how to invite that wildlife into your backyard um, in a way that's beneficial to them. And as you pointed out, it's beneficial to us too, you know, in terms of- We're definitely the winners. Yes. Uh, all, all the studies that show, you know, about how it helps us with depression, how it helps us with our, you know, immune system even, um, being outdoors and being in nature. So yeah, it's, it's something that more people need to do, especially since we're having our, our two weeks of spring right now, right? <laughs> so we get- <laughs> This is true that we get in Texas before it gets warm. Um, so I encourage everyone to go outside. It's a little bit overcast today, but um, go see what birds you have. Um, see where you can put some, maybe some more plants in for your birds and your other wildlife. <laughs> and uh, even the squirrels that are, I know sometimes, those of us that are vegetable gardeners, sometimes they seem like our nemesis. <laughs> but well, there's a magic, it's called chicken wire. <laughs> Make a chicken wire top. And it'll frustrate them and it'll go away. <laughs> yes, yes. Sometimes the physical barrier is the only thing that will keep them out. <laughs> well, that's my experience anyway from my loss of uh, a lot of tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's why I only grow cherry tomatoes now. So if I lose a few, I, I won't be super sad instead of losing a nice pretty beefsteak tomato, you know, where they, like you, I think you talked about before um, we started about how they, they like to take nibbles out of them. Yeah, I don't know. Again, <laughs> I, you know, those, their eyes are bigger than their appetite or something like that. <laughs> all right well thank you all so much everyone um enjoy today's weather um and thank you dr nadalo again for sharing all your wisdom with us it was a pleasure thank you for having me thank you all so much take care everyone <laughs>